bhavatu sahanau bhunaktu sahavirya karava vahai tejasvi navadhi tamastu mavid vishadahai aum shanti 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 Namaste. So, we have shown the thousand names of Lord Vishnu, Vishnu Sahasranama, and we have not explained it. So, for those of you who haven't read Mahabharata or who haven't studied these things deeply, briefly, the uh, thousand names are narrated by Bhishma. Bhishma is the eldest grandsire of the Kuru dynasty. And Arjuna uh, is a member of the five Pandavas, five brothers. And uh, they had a big fight with their cousins, the rest of the Kurus about who was going to be the emperor. And after this big fight, the Battle of Kurukshetra, really all the soldiers on both sides were killed. <laughs> it was devastating. And this is how Kali Yuga got started because that meant all the qualified kings and administrators were dead. So then rogues and thieves took over the governments, which we can still see going on today. And uh, Kali Yuga came in full force. So after this devastating battle, Yudhishthira, the eldest of the five Pandava brothers, approached Bhishma for instruction. He was the new emperor. So how is he to govern his kingdom? I should mention Yudhishthira is a king of unparalleled, exalted character. He was so spiritual minded. His brothers used to tease him that he's more like a Brahmana than a Kshatriya. <laughs> So uh, he liked to hang out with the brahmanas and hear recitations from the Vedas and so on. This was his favorite thing to do. But he was also a great warrior. And he and his brothers uh, defeated a much larger army to win the Battle of Kurukshetra. However, in order to do so, they had to defeat their own guru and maternal grandfather, Bhishma. And so Bhishma was such a ferocious fighter, even though he's very old, that they literally had to surround him and just pour so many arrows into his body that he was like a pincushion. And finally, then he fell off his chariot and he lay dying. Uh, on this bed of arrows. So after the battle, it's a very poignant scene. Yudhishthira and his brothers approach Bhishma and they ask him for instructions. So Krishna is there. He gives Bhishma the, the boon that he will not feel any pain from his wounds. <laughs> so he can give adequate instruction to the new emperor, Yudhishthira. So that's the backstory. I'm summarizing about 1,500 pages of dense <laughs> story. But anyway, um, the scene opens on the battlefield with the principal characters, the Pandavas, Krishna, 
Vyasadeva, even Shiva is there, uh, surrounding Grandfather Bhishma and inquiring from him. Yudhishthira uvacha kime kang daivatang loke king vapye kang parayanam stuvanta kang kamarchanta prapnu yurmana vasubham ko dharma sarva dharmanam bhavata paramo mataha king japan muchate jantur janma samsara bandhanat so in these two verses, Yudhishthira asks six questions of Bhishma. And uh, these are analyzed by Shankaracharya as follows. Who is the one deity in the world? What is the sole and supreme goal? Whom should men praise and worship to attain the good? What is that dharma which is regarded by you as the supreme among all dharmas? And by reciting what hymn is mankind freed from the bonds of birth and samsara? Bhishma answered as follows. First he answered question number six. Jagat Prabhum Deva Deva Manantam Purushottamam Stuvan Nama Sahasrena Purusha Satatotitaha The man who is ever engaged in praising the Lord of the universe, the God of gods, the infinite and supreme Purusha with his thousand names, gets beyond all grief. Now you have to understand that these men were not ordinary kings. They weren't rascal leaders like we see today, but they were actually qualified. For example, Yudhishthira's uh, famous motto was, all good to the citizens. And he really meant it. He considered it a vow to do the best he could for the elevation of the population in general. So different from today's governments. So when he says all good, what he means is that the purpose of the government administration is to create conditions such that the populace can be elevated to the supreme self-realization and thereby all sufferings are gone forever. That's his definition of the good. So Bhishma answers this question appropriately that, so uh, what men have to do is to praise and worship the Supreme Being, the Purusha, the original person, with his 1,000 names. Now, why is this? Because when you call someone by their name, <laughs> when you call them directly by their name, not just, hey, you, huh? hey, God, but you address by their name, beginning with Aum. The names of God are, of course, unlimited. But there are specific names which are uh, really only applicable to the Supreme Purusha. And these names uh, get his attention, just like an ordinary person when they're called by their name. I remember my Adi Guru once said, don't act so you can see God. Act so that God will want to see you. So in other words, act in such a way that even God will be attracted. He want to see, well, who is this acting so nicely? So in this way, these thousand names attract the attention of the Purusha 
And then, of course, we get the benefit of his association and blessings. Next, Bhishma answers the fourth question. Whom should men worship to attain the good? Tameva charchaya nityam bhaktya purusham avyayam dhyayan stuvangyam asyangscha yajamanas tameva cha By always worshipping with devotion, that imperishable Purusha, by meditating on him, praising him, and by bowing down before him, the worshiper gets beyond all grief. So these are the basic methods of worship. You notice he doesn't mention making opulent offerings or uh, great gestures of charity work or any kind of civil benefits or anything like that. He says simply by worshiping with devotion, meditating and praising him, and very important, bowing down before him. Again, my Adi Guru taught that by bowing down before your Guru and before God, you obligate them. Why? Because, this is a wonderful story, <laughs> Lord Rama, in his incarnation, uh, when he was about to cross the ocean to Sri Lanka and attack uh, the demon Ravana, who had stolen his wife, Ramana's brother defected. He said, I've been telling you, Ravana, all along that what you're doing is wrong. You don't listen to me, so I'm leaving. I'm going to the other side. You know, good luck. <laughs> So he came to Lord Rama, and he was a little apprehensive. Well, maybe Rama is going to kill me, but I don't care. I just want to do the right thing. So he came to Lord Rama, and he bowed down. And uh, everybody was looking at, you know, Rama, what do you, why, why don't you just kill this guy? He's Ravana's brother. And so Rama said something very significant. He said, anyone who takes shelter of me, no matter who they are, I vow to protect him. So this promise is still good today. And it's the foundation of our uh, process of worship that one who takes sincere shelter of God, symbolized by paying obeisances, namaskaram, or dandavats, even better dandavats, falling down like a stick, they are protected. Protected from what? Well, all kinds of evil, misunderstandings, conflicts, um, bad karma, inauspicious planets, you name it. <laughs> uh, this is why uh, having a Jupiter or Guru in an auspicious place in one's birth chart is extremely favorable for spiritual realization. It means that one has surrendered in past lives. And so that promise of protection is still good even in this life. Once he makes a promise, he doesn't take it back. So, next time we'll continue with the next questions. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.